This is a free recording by Cambridge Cookbooks, etc. We hope you enjoy and benefit from the content. Also, please consider donating to the new Cambridge Mosque. Please visit Cambridge Mosque is moving dot org dot uk. رَبِّ يَسِّرْ وَأَعِنْ يَا كَرِيمْ وَفْتَحْ بِالْحَقِّ إِنَّكَ الْفَتَاحُ الْعَلِيمُ It's been a long term, we've all been busy. I don't propose to keep it too long. I just wanted to uh, float a few ideas uh, to do with the nature of God's law, to do with the nature of the Sharia. Because it's uh, always in the headlines, and it is that by which we are Mukallafun and Mukallafat, that is to say, obligated and accountable. If you are adult and Muslim, the uh, yoke of the law is upon you. Uh, but at the same time as it being this enormously <coughs> significant, weighty matter, it's also the case that its interpretation is contentious. Not only is its interpretation contentious, but its administration is uh, patchy. <coughs> and to many of us nowadays, um, we may have had no actual experience of it. So let's uh, backtrack a little bit and imagine the ways in which human beings can uh, create boundaries for themselves or can accept boundaries for themselves. Pure anarchy does not work and never has worked. Uh, As social animals, we uh, require boundaries, and the reason for that is the human ego. And that's al-ammara bisu, which likes to take and take and take. But there's also the fact that there has to be an inward dignity. Two sets of boundaries that are implicit in the concept of sacred law. The uh, outward dignity of people who wish their rights to be respected, and the Sharia has historically recognized five or six of these, the right to wealth, the right to religion, the right to honor, the right to family, the right to wealth. The lists differ a little bit, but those are essentially the forms of dignity or the rights which are innate in us, bihaqal adamiyya, in the Maturidi Hanafi tradition in particular, these are regarded as innate uh, by the fact of descendant, of being descendants of Sayyidina Adam, alayhi salam. We have these rights. They are not acquired. How they express themselves and how they can be lost uh, is, of course, a contentious matter. <coughs> but intrinsically, we recognize the principle of uh, innate boundaries, <coughs> and innate dignity and innate <coughs> rights. So we could say that we start off from a point <coughs> that seems to be akin to the conventional enlightenment discourse of inalienable or innate intrinsic rights. Uh, but the difference is that we actually have a basis for saying that these things are intrinsic. Properly speaking, there are no universals in an atheistic or a materialistic perspective of the world. For something to be universal, it has to transcend the particularities of matter and the ebb and flow that is the nature of matter. But uh, if there is only matter, then there are no universals. Principles are just abstractions, useful to certain minds, certain societies at various points, but they can't really be considered universals that are intrinsic in the nature of being From the secular point of view, there's nothing intrinsic about good and evil. These are human perceptions, human constructions. From a theistic, religious point of view, uh, and from the perspective, the revealed perspective of Islam, there are innate rights. And it's easier for us to establish this than it is for certain other forms of monotheism. (coughs) In the absence of a doctrine of original sin, there is something that is intrinsically noble already, about the human being the moment it starts, at the moment of uh, uh, the ruh, breathing in of the spirit, and that is when its rights are intrinsic and settled 
so that even uh, a fetus has the right uh, to do various things in Islamic law, can even inherit according to certain, uh, certain schools. So if you're still a fetus, but a family relative dies, you can still, on some fatwas, uh, inherit. But dignity is that. So uh, religious law starts off with this major, as it were, philosophical advantage, namely that we can credibly claim that there are universals rather than that just being uh, a nice thing to believe, which is what is the basis of the secular enlightenment perspective. Um, however, it's also the case that what is intrinsic is not there because of the nature of matter itself. There is nothing about this world of atom, atoms and neutrons and protons and bosons that is intrinsically uh, generative of a particular set of ethics. Instead, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has determined the ethical weight that is carried by the cosmos, and which only really becomes significant once um, any Adam are created and enter the cosmic system. So good and evil are not intrinsic in the nature of matter. Matter is just matter. A scientist can't spot good and evil. Uh, but neither are good and evil just inventions of fertile or virtuous human minds. Instead, good and evil are from the divine wada, the divine decree and the divine determination. And there's two ways in which they can be perceived. And the ulama have taken various different views here. The Mu'tazilites, the early sect, almost took the view that they are intrinsic to the nature of matter, intrinsic to the nature of creation. Um, certain other scholars took the view that they are a completely arbitrary declaration of the divine power. But generally the ulama congregate somewhere in the middle, and the two most widely followed schools of uh, Islamic theology, the Asharis and the Maturidis, do differ on this point. Uh, you could say there is uh, a natural virtue akin to natural law which is imbued by the divine will into the relationality of creation itself so that murder is wrong even if a revelation has not yet come to say that it is still intrinsically wrong because of the divine not because of something intrinsic in matter but uh, to what extent is that, is that binding and incumbent? And this is one of the classic points where the Ottoman that differ. And the Asha'ira, the Asha'iris, who are probably the most widely followed school of, of theology in Islamic history, say that uh, nothing is incumbent or obligatory before the revelation comes. You can know right from wrong. You might intuit by seeing this, as it were, ethical glow that has been placed in the material world, and you can intuit from the behaviour of animals and look at your, looking at your fitra, and you can feel murder is wrong, telling lies is wrong, cheating is wrong, being dishonest is wrong, beauty is good, ugliness is wrong. But there's only become things for which you can be taken to account at the judgment. They only really become binding universals once you've had that spelt out in Revelation. Whereas for the, from the point of view of the majority of the, the, the Maturidi scholars, they say that uh, it actually can be incumbent upon you to know certain generalities of good and evil. Even if you're a baby washed up on a desert island and you've never met another human being and you've never experienced any of Allah's books, you are still considered to be bound by certain general principles. And you will be called to account for that at the last day. And this is a, a classical difference. In, in practice, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference because the Sharia is applicable to us in uh, either case once the revelation has come. But it's to do with this, as it were, ontology of virtue. To what extent uh, virtue, beauty, goodness can be said to be part of the intrinsicality of creation? Can you say 
that there is something beautiful if there's nobody to perceive it and the concept of beauty has not been uh, created. These are difficult issues. <coughs> but in any case, uh, the general Islamic view is that you are only bound by the details of God's law once that law has been set before you. And that's common sense and it's to do with the divine justice and it's one of the motives for da'wah. So there is a sense in which boundaries, knowledge of good and evil law, therefore, is really intrinsic to what it is to be human. Because it's uh, a celebration of people's rights that should not be violated, that are there and that are innate, and that are to do with our perception of the nature of creation. Uh, but it is also the case that it exists in another register which is to do with our intrinsic dignity. It's not just about our right not to be insulted or to be um, the object of the theft or the cupidity or the jealousy of the lives of others. Our dignity doesn't just consist in that. Our dignity also consists in our production of virtues, irrespective of how they're received. And that also is part of the divine purpose in creating us as, as social animals so that there would be mu'amala, um, a deen mu'amala, religion is, is, is based off the idea of uh, interaction engagement with others and human beings cannot really function in the great majority of cases as flourishing entities if they're on their own or if their social networks are defective or if they're in a culture where relationality is, is, is deteriorated we are social animals so there is that aspect of it as well that the sharia is not just to ennoble and to protect others it's there to ennoble and protect ourselves. And to protect ourselves from others, that's just the reciprocation of the first principle, but also to protect ourselves from ourselves. And this is one way of looking at the distinction between Hukukullah and Hukuk al Ibad, which is fundamental in the Sharia manuals. Allah's rights and the rights of Allah's servants. So one of Allah's rights would be that He alone be worshipped. And one of a servant's rights would be that um, you don't cheat on your taxes. Different categories, but also expressed in terms of, of rights. But uh, these hukukullah are to do more centrally with our own internal dignity because they represent the form, the intended form of our creation. Human beings are created for worship. Illa liya'budu. That's why we're created, just to worship. And if we are not discharging these divine rights over us, then we are not fully operating as uh, uh, sentient and responsible human beings occupying the due place in creation. Just like a lion who is a vegetarian, for instance, would be an aberration in the nature of things. So also a human being that doesn't worship is an aberration in the nature of things because that's what we've been created to do. So our dignity consists in uh, operationalizing the divine pattern which is intended for human beings. And in this there are certain universals <coughs> that don't change because they're to do with the nature of the human divine relation. And there are certain things also that are contingent. And of those universals you could say that Allah alone you worshipped, that lying is wrong that courage is a virtue. These are universal, and there's a list of virtues which is recognized as such in just about every culture. Uh, and those we might say, those fadail represent universal forms whereby the dignity of Bani Adam is affirmed. Karamna Bani Adam, we've ennobled the descendants of Adam. Part of that is the fact that we walk erect upon the earth and that we have this inner rectitude, istiqama as well, that comes from the following of these, these fadail. But there is also the dimension of our relationality to others, uh, which is to do with self-transcendence and self-giving in which the istiqamah can become actualized and real. So we are there to offer ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and part of that is to interact harmoniously with the rest of creation, 
recognizing that that register of creation that has the most rights over us is other human beings because they participate also in these these, these hukuk, hukuk al um, and in the, the basic takrim karamna bani adam other human beings intrinsically deserve that and part of our self-transcendence uh, is to recognize that we must make sacrifices for the rights of others so it's clear that there's something intrinsic in human nature, in human society, in our relationship to Allah, to the rest of the world, which requires regulation, which requires boundaries. It's not native to us to live in a freewheeling, slob-like, self-indulgent way, just following our own impulses. It's important to bear this in mind because part of contemporary culture, and one of the paradoxes of contemporary culture, is that on the one hand, The modern world is by far the most intensely regulated society there's ever been. There are just so many laws. Parliament works overtime, passing more and more and more laws. Um, And that is in tension with the other tendency of modernity, which is individualism, to do our own thing, to press against the boundaries and to indulge ourselves, to enjoy ourselves, and to believe that our flourishing comes about through being able to do as much as we possibly can. The modern man or woman is a kind of magpie of experiences. Wants to do this, wants to do that, wants to go to this place and have that thing and we want to collect. Um, Because in some sense we think that we can't extend our lives in time but we can kind of make them really complicated and and diverse. And the more we have somehow, the more we will taste eternity. يَحْسَبُ أَنَّ مَا لَهُ أَخْلَدَ Does he think that his money is going to make him eternal? Of course he doesn't really think that. It's not going to make him live to be 200 if he makes a million pounds. But he might well feel that he's really going to live his life to the full. So he has to go to Barbados, and he has to go to Lake Como, and he has to do water skiing, and he has to have this woman... (coughs) That's what he's doing, getting as much of dunya as he can, because he's not going to go on forever. And that's a tendency that we have. Uh, And uh, that's very much part of the modern desire, to get as much as we can and to have as many experiences as we can as a compensation for the loss of eternity, which is the price of the his belief. So... Uh, there is this modern tendency to to push the boundaries, to break boundaries in the belief that the bigger we are, the bigger our personalities, the more we acquire, the more experiences we have, the more fulfilled we will be. And that's really important to the modern mind. Opportunity uh, is so important. Freedom is so important. And this is part of the modern rhetoric. We no longer believe in istiqamah and obaldiya and submission to heaven. And to compensate for that, we just become obese, overweight. We get as much stuff as we possibly can. We want a bigger house, we want a bigger car, we want more interesting holidays, more and more and more. And this again is organically diagnosed. al hakum to careful. Competition in worldly increase distracts you. And it is distracting. Dunya is dangerous. So there is uh, that aspect of modernity, the desire to get more and more, which doesn't sit well with an idea of a very regulated life. And that's one of the reasons for the tensions and stresses of modern life. Because in order to get all of the stuff and to progress in our careers, we have to to be um, acquisitive and pushy and competitive. But at the same time, we're in a space where there's so much regulation that we're constantly banging our heads against some rule or other, uh, and somebody or other is determining what we're doing every moment of the day. Every successful company employs management consultants or time and motion men who make sure that everybody is working hard and working to deadlines and have proper plans so that every idle minute in the day is zapped and used up in some task that will benefit the company or the employer. So leisure stillness, contemplation, gazing out of the window, talking to somebody over the water machine, those are kind of things that are a problem 
given the Tekath or civilization, and in a very successful corporation, the corporation takes you over. The Japanese are the masters of that, but increasingly that's the model in America and elsewhere. The corporation is your life, and that's um, what you are, defen- defines your identity. Uh, so there's this tension in the modern world, and that's one reason why there are so many people with mental breakdowns and psychological difficulties, addiction issues, uh, drink issues, relationship <coughs> issues, because it's too much for us. We're not designed to be um, working at this incredibly hypertrophically, intellectually focused pace with somebody watching us um, all day. Um, the call centers are the worst, but other jobs are moving in that direction. There's always somebody scrutinizing at a stint list that you have to fit in. Uh, but at the same time, all of these boundaries, and it's claustrophobic, but it's hard work. That's not how human beings are meant to be. For the great bulk of the history of our species, we've been hunter-gatherers, we've been fishermen, we've been scratching a living from the soil, we've been small business people in cities, we've been leading caravans from Istanbul to China that would take four months and you just sat and you had a time those time. The modern world doesn't give us much time. There's a little baraka in our walks. And as a result, we're stressed out because we're not designed for this. We're designed to have a certain amount of time for sleep, for prayer, for family, for contemplation of things that don't make us or anybody any money. But those things, because of the nature of the modern world, with the commodification of everything, are being squeezed out. So that's the paradox of modernity. Lots and lots of laws and regulations. And just in my building here, where I work, last year we were forced to spend £40,000 automating all of the doors in the faculty because um, we have one or two students in wheelchairs. So they press a button and the door opens and through they go. And that was the rule and we had to do it. It's more or less doubled our fuel bill, but never mind. Now they've just passed a new regulation saying that nobody may be allowed to use the lift in the building uh, if uh, in the case of an emergency they wouldn't be able to get out by any other means which means that the people in wheelchairs can't go to all of those floors in the building where we've just installed the automatic doors they can only go to the area in the building where we don't have the doors so we're all stressed out constantly by the clashing of uh, rules and it goes on and on and if you've ever had the misfortune of walking any distance with the book called Statutes and Ordinances at the University of Cambridge, you'll know what I mean. It's a huge, weighty term, and it gets bigger every year because our lives get more complicated, and this is the future that faces us, things that are unlikely to get much simpler. So there is that, and this is an aberrant form of behaviour, a society which values leisure but gives us very little of it. A society which values freedom but really ties us up with a million different rules uh, and a society <coughs> that knows that we're designed for something else but is pushing us more and more into this mechanistic role of the servant of uh, an economy that's increasingly functioning like uh, a machine and doesn't really have a soul to it. There's no purpose to the modern process, no ultimate goal. Other civilizations had an ultimate goal, people working together for the glory of God or gods, the modern world just exists to perpetuate itself more of the same progress towards an ideal that they can no longer conceive of, but greater comfort presumably comes into the picture. So this is the contemporary aberrant uh, consequence of a system where there has to be law and regulation, but where it's really got out of control. And it's against that backdrop that we need to consider um, the revealed laws of Islam. It's not as if the West is all about freedom and few rules and the Sharia is about tying people up. The reality is people in traditional Sharia jurisdictions had a lot more time and there were fewer rules. You could travel from Constantinople to Beijing and you didn't need a passport even. Now, the visa nightmare is just another reminder of how uh, qualified is the modern world's commitment to the idea of freedom. In any case... There are different ways of recognizing that human beings need laws, and that there have to be laws. And you could say there's three big categories uh, in which laws all have to exist. 
you could say that there is the idea of codified statutory laws. That is to say that uh, a parliament guided by various committees and men in wigs decides to legislate and that the legislation is taken to be internally coherent and based on certain sort of first philosophical principles which in the modern world are about public interest as defined by some kind of consensus. So the Code Napoleon would be the best known example of that. Um, the Napoleonic Code, code which is still the basis of French law is the basis of law in many Muslim countries like Egypt, for instance, the basic assumption. Saudi Arabia, the, the commercial courts operate on the basis of Egyptian uh, commercial law, which is rooted ultimately in the Napoleon. Very widespread system, very philosophically brilliant, and the idea is that every possible infraction or form of problematic human behavior is covered in this huge architecturally symmetrical, philosophically elegant system. You then have uh, a different system, which is what we operate under in this country, which is common law, uh, where there isn't really somebody sharpening his pencil and writing it all out, but it's a process of the accumulation of judgments over centuries, so that the law is what has normally been done, and it might need to be revised. And Parliament in the UK has this rather anomalous role of being able to pass new laws but that's not the basic concept of legality in England. The basic concept of legality is the case law accumulated by the courts over generations and centuries, the idea being that eventually they'll get it right. If the law is too outrageous, it'll fall into desuetude. It's a kind of Darwinian model, survival of the fittest. And it works, and its advantage is that it tends to come from the experience of the population rather than from a bunch of philosophers or jurists with funny hats imposing their philosophical vision on the population. The third model of law is juristic law, which is uh, essentially uh, the model favoured by Islamic law. Islamic law is the only substantial, still viable model of this. Jewish law, to some extent, uh, corresponds to this, but it does function rather differently, partly because Jewish law hasn't been practised very much because the Jews simply haven't had a, a, a context, a jurisdiction in which to do it. So medieval Jewish law in the Talmud tends to take the form of long discussions and very often there's no particular answer reached because it doesn't actually matter because the law's not going to be put into practice with the exception of things like personal statute laws where there would be rabbinical courts that would implement judgments on issues of marriage, divorce, inheritance and those things. But uh, in Islamic law, we have this very different system, which is certainly not based on case law, what a court might have done 100 years ago, <coughs> doesn't make any difference to a qadi in an Islamic system. It's not cumulative like that. It might be interesting in that one would want to know why that judgment was made, but it's not in itself a precedent. Similarly, it is not statutory law in that there is no authoritative team um, who write it all out in some comprehensive and consistent system like the Code Napoleon like to some extent um, Roman law instead it's, it's something very different and it's very important that we understand how different it is because in the last hundred years or perhaps two hundred years it's been changed a lot to make it look much more like statutory law uh, the original form of Islamic law, once you move beyond the prophetic age, and in the prophetic age it's different because there you don't need mujtahids and muftis, you have the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that is the law. But in subsequent generations, Islamic law, as we know it, emerges as a process of deduction from the prophetic age. And the process of deduction is... <coughs> From a Western jurisprudential point of view, rather singular. I don't intend to go now into the details of Usul al Fiqh and Qiyas and Ijma and Istihsan and those things, um, they're quite familiar. But the point is the creation of the law represents the jurists' attempt to write themselves out of the process of mediating between the present and the revelation. <coughs> 
to the extent that the jurist isn't getting involved in legislation, he's a good jurist. It's the opposite of the Western model. You say such and such a chief jurist legislated such and such a law in France, and maybe it's even got his name. In Islamic law, it's not like that. The purpose of the jurist is to vanish, just like the great calligrapher. He's so good that you forget his personality because he's just got the letters perfect. Uh, so it's an exercise in self-annihilation. The function of the jurist is to transmit and to make known and usable the divine law. It's not a team of lawyers in funny hats that works things out. It's not generations of legal practice in the Anglo-American system. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the legislator, having already, as it were, irradiated creation with meaning, with beauty, and with truth, and with virtue. He then proceeds to legislate through uh, revelation. Is what is intrinsic to creation just the same as what is in revelation? It can't quite be. The basic norms, the basic universals of values, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has irradiated into creation, uh, are there, but instantiated in different revelations in different ways. And that's why we say that the sharia does not represent a set of universals. There are universals, uh, but they, as it were, stand outside and before the Sharia. So something like not killing innocent people is universal because Allah has legislated it in the nature of creation itself. And individual episodes of revelation will confirm that. But not everything that is there in every episode of revelation is going to coincide with everything that is evidently the case in the nature of, of, of the moral, morally significant universe. Because the, reg the legislation changes, there is the principle of abrogation. Nasr. It's not just that the earlier revelation has been distorted, misinterpreted, lost. It's that the, leg the legislation can change. So that, for instance, the, the ulama are aware that in the time of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, it was permissible to drink wine. And then for the Muslims, it became impermissible. For the ancient Israelites, we can see that they were commanded to pray three times a day. The Umar of Islam, for the Mi'raj, is commanded to pray five times a day. So praying five times a day is not to do with the intrinsicality of, of, of the morally significant creation. It's to do with our particular way of being in it. So the legislation of Sharia does not constitute universals, things that are in themselves intrinsic, but represent in our particular um, stage of al-wahi al-Muhammadi, Muhammadan revelation, represent what is right and is acceptable. That's important because it, as it were, de-absolutizes the principles of Sharia, which is to say that uh, they... Uh, represent principles where there might be possible different interpretations. And uh, that is the whole story of the evolution of Islamic law, that it's all about different interpretations. <coughs> Imam Shatabi asks the rhetorical question. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says things in the Quran and they're articulated in the hadith that we could imagine could have been expressed in a way that clears up any doubt. For instance, what does that mean? Different possible interpretations, and after 500 years, we haven't worked out which is the right one. And he says the reason for that is that it is his will that the Ummah shall be an intelligent community that discusses these things. And this is part of the principle of Shura, that we get together in order to try and figure out what is right. And Allah, in his mercy, will accept the incorrect ijtihad, if it's sincere, as well as the sincere ijtihad. So pluralism is intrinsic to the nature of the Sharia, of Islamic law. And it's also part of the reality of Islamic law. But note in our emphasis on the role of the fuqaha that the ruler doesn't get a look in. And this really blows the mind of people in the modern world who assume that, of course, it's the state that legislates. 
after all, in England, that's what Parliament does. Um, uh, and that's what the President of France does, and that's what everybody does. Isn't that what governments do? <coughs> Not in the case of a traditional Syria jurisdiction. The state has no intrinsic right to legislate or to interfere in any way in the deliberations of the Fokaha. Now, the state in the classical Mawardi Islamic Abbasid model generally had the right to do things like to appoint qadis or to sack qadis who were really not performing. The state might also surround the ruler with muftis who would be assimilated in some way into the, uh, the, the structures, the deliberations of the state. And this seems to have started with the Mamluks, the Mamluk sultans in Egypt, 14th century, were the first to have muftis as part of the royal entourage, rather than just scribes and advisors and wazirs of various kinds. And certainly in the Ottoman system, um, the, the mufti of Istanbul was an enormously significant figure at the imperial court. But the state does not legislate. And that begs the question of what the government actually does do. Well, the role of the, uh, the emir or the sultan or the khalifa is, uh, first of all, to ensure that the borders are safe and, where possible and appropriate, being expanded. That's an older classical text. He has to defend and where possible, expand the Darul Islam at the expense of the lands of barbarism. Uh, and he alone has the right to call for jihad and to call an end to jihad and enter into treaty. So basically, his function is mainly occupied in the foreign ministry. Um, if you walked down Whitehall following uh, the introduction of Sharia in the UK, you probably see most of the ministries were downscaled or wouldn't even exist. The classical Muslim model of the state is pretty minimalist. You wouldn't have a ministry of education, for instance. Education was done by communities, by the population. Why should the state get involved at all? Um, no ministry of health. Again, communities. al Khaf would be supporting um, the poor and supporting the provision of health, uh, and so on. Things like the Ministry of Information. Ministry of the Interior, well, generally communities would regulate their own internal security, but there might be some kind of dark or police that the local Amir would um, unleash on the street, just as night watchmen, but basically there wasn't very much of that. Certainly no Ministry of Justice. The parties were doing their thing in the courts, and the state could not interfere either in telling them what the law was or in interfering in the, the processes of the law. So it's a very strange model. And it's worth remembering this because nowadays uh, in the Islamic world, and particularly in the aftermath of the so-called Arab Spring, everybody wants to Islamize the system and have an Islamic state. How do you actually do that if the model of government in classical Islam doesn't look at all like the model that you need to be part of the modern family of nation states. Can you have a modern state that doesn't have a ministry of justice, a ministry of education, a ministry of health, and all of those things, where the state is really minimal and taxes are minimal as well? Um, can you actually do that? Well, one of the issues that have arisen in Sharia had discussions and were very complex and quite bitter in the 19th century, although they're almost forgotten now, is the extent to which the state can be allowed to get involved in the shaping of law. Now, the Ottoman sultans had occasionally issued directives, which they called qanun, generally in areas that you would regard as not being particularly religiously significant, like somebody wants to irrigate an area along the banks of the Euphrates um, and he wants the government to provide a law that makes that possible and the Sultan would issue a Qanun Nameh and that would be like an, an imperial script, and that was 
something that would be imposed and would be regard, regarded as legal. But that's a kind of aberration in the Sharia system. It's not really the government's responsibility or right to do that. And many of the jurists were very uncomfortable with these norms and about, with the extent to which they could actually be um, dealt with in the, the Sharia courts. Um, but in the uh, later 19th century, the problem of the independent judiciary became quite acute. The Ottoman Empire was industrialising. They were servicing a major foreign debt, largely on the back of things like tobacco revenues. The Egyptians were the same, largely on the back of the Suez Canal revenues, modernising, the society becoming more complex. And the old system, whereby justice was administered by the Qadi, with the help of the Mufti, really seemed rather problematic because the Qadi or the Mufti might come up with different rulings in different towns or in different times. It's fine for the very quiet, simple, classical model of an Islamic city or an Islamic village or your desert tribe, but for a nation-state where the economy is becoming very segmented, professionalised, complicated, uh, it wasn't clear to the Ottomans that this was working, and many reformers in the 1850s, 1860s identified this as one of the reasons for Ottoman decline. They couldn't get a modern economy going because companies didn't want to e invest in the Muslim world because they didn't know what the law would be when they finally went to the party. They asked for the Ottoman laws, there weren't any. The state says law is not our business, and so people um, took their business elsewhere. <coughs> So you have, uh, in the second half of the 19th century in the Ottoman Empire, a process of uh, incorporation of Western models, the creation of a parliament, uh, the creation of a ministry of justice, uh, and the creation of generally the full range of ministries that um, European countries in the 19th century had, and a massive increase in the bureaucracy of the state, and of course uh, taxation to match. Ministry of Defence. Uh, and when they looked at this completely decentralised legal system, where the Qadis were doing their own thing <coughs> on the basis of the patois and the muhtasaras and the text that they were working with, um, the Ottoman reformers said, we have to have a single law for the whole of our empire, from Bosnia to Yemen, a single law. But we wanted to be Islamic. And so they got together a, a committee of ulama to produce what became the Majalati Ahkam Adliya, which is the first civil code really in, in the Muslim world designed by Muslims, which was based on the Hanafi law, which was the prevailing imperial map of, of, of the Ottoman Turks. Uh, and that became state law. The state was legislating. They said, on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it's still the state that was deciding which fatwas were going to become the law. And all of the Qadis found that their authority was massively curtailed, because now they had to follow the law that the state was sending them. They got the majalla delivered to them by the Ottoman postman, and they had to implement that in their courts. This had all kinds of implications. One of the virtues of the traditional, highly decentralized Islamic system of justice, where the Qadi and the local Mufti are very much local and know the local situation, is that interpretations would be easily tailored to deal with the situation that the Qadi knew. The Qadi would usually know the people who were in front of him. He would know the background. If he wanted to make inquiries, he would know exactly how to do that. The Mufti also would know exactly the context uh, of the situation that he was being asked for at first. But once you had the new Ottoman imperial law, everybody had to apply the same set of laws, um, irrespective of the people that were in front of them, and the list of penalties went right up. In traditional Islamic law, there's seven or eight statutory offences, hudud offences, the big thing. Uh, and the ta'zir penalties generally determined by the discretion of the Qadi. And there might be some kind of experience of what is an appropriate fine, for instance. Somebody's donkey breaks into your barley patch and eats some of the barley, and what do you do about that? You won't find it in the books of fiqh, 
how much the compensation should be. It's the father's responsibility to determine that appropriately. But with the new system, it didn't matter whether you, you were having a, a donkey broken in Bosnia or Albania or Yemen. It was the same principles that were being applied. Uh, and that led to many objective uh, injustices and took the system far away from what it was originally conceived to be, which was based on local wisdom. The idea of Ahl al-Sunnah wa Jama'ah is that it is the Jama'ah that is following the Sunnah. The Jama'ah is the ordinary Muslims. It comes from beneath. The Western system, the statutory system, is an elite determining how people shall be everywhere from above. And that was the, the legal revolution that happened in the Ottoman Empire in the, the 19th century. And the Majalla is still kind of a law book in some places. Some of the courts in Abu Sabi, for instance, will still be using the Majalla. It's a very interesting legal achievement. But the idea of statutory law is different and is strange. <clears throat> Another of the consequences of this, as well as the demotion of the Qadi into a kind of legal scribe, really, uh, was the demotion of the significance of the Mufti. <clears throat> Muslims nowadays often don't seem to use muftis very much. We go online and we look up something on some <coughs> website and we assume that that is the hukum that we want or we look it up in some big manual of classical law. But the fatwa collections and the access to the muftis is something less usual. But in classical Islamic world, most people access the law in the form of fatwas. Um, basically in three forms... Um, there would be a kind of individual fatwa, which didn't necessarily involve some legal infraction. So you would ask your local mufti, saying, um, for instance, uh, is it all right for me to join my prayers when I'm travelling to such and such a town? And the mufti would give him the verdict. Nobody else was particularly involved. Then there were what you might call governmental or state fatwas, so that a ruler uh, would ask the mufti for validation of something that he was probably going to do anyway, like invade a neighboring country. And the Ottomans, before launching a jihad, would always get the, the mufti's sanction. Um, and the third type of fatwa, which was by far the most common, tended to relate to uh, situations in the courts. So a qadi... In most cases, the things that would come before him would be predictable and repetitive, and he'd know what the answer was. If he wasn't sure, um, usually he would ask a mufti, and there might be a mufti attached to the court, if it was a relatively big court, or it might be somebody in a neighbouring town, but he'd ask the mufti, and the mufti would give him the answer, usually in a very short form, yes or no. Um, Occasionally, and this is interesting because sometimes we tend to assume that there's no right of appeal in Sharia. In fact, um, if you disagree with the judgment of a qadi, you can only really disagree with it on the basis that you think it's not Allah's law that has been applied. Uh, you can uh, write to a mufti, and the mufti will then give you a fatwa, um, which will indicate that the, the, the hukum of the qadi should not be applied. But uh, an actual court of appeal or istidnaf is something generally that doesn't happen in the Sharia system because speed is regarded as very important. The idea of the modern court with the case which goes on uh, for years in some cases uh, at gigantic expense it is anathema to the Islamic system which has to be quick and is um, based on not much infrastructure. The Qadi could be sitting in a coffee house or under a tree doesn't even have to have a building. You don't need a jury. You don't need lawyers. It's the Qadi. You might ask for people to um, give their opinion, expert consultation. But basically, it's, it's the Qadi and the plaintiff and the defendant. It's so a very quickly resolved uh, system. Uh, all of that went out of the window, and the responsibility of the Mufti diminished substantially with the introduction of the Majella and other things that happened in Afghanistan and in Iran. Um, the British were already fiddling with the system in the subcontinent, the Dutch in Indonesia. By the end of the 19th century, there wasn't really uh, a functioning classical Sharia jurisdiction any longer. Everything had been centralised. Everywhere now had a Ministry of Justice. 
So uh, this was a transformation that took place, and <coughs> in the post-imperial period, most of the Muslim leaders and their advisors had really forgotten what the old system was. Uh, so even where they wanted to return to Sharia, their idea of Sharia was that it should be statutory law on the Western model. Uh, and the old idea of the Qadi and the palm tree, who really knew the environment and knew his fiqh and was trusted by people, but whose judgment might be quite different from somebody in another province, was not really factored into anybody's calculations. And as far as one can see, it's a model that's been essentially lost sight of. Um, which is essentially um, the point that I wish to make. Uh, so the question is, is a modern Islamic Sharia jurisdiction, such as that of the places that claim that they have it, Pakistan, um, Saudi Arabia, wherever, or what they may try to do in Libya or some other places, if it's statutory law, is it actually Sharia at all? It may bravely claim to be Sharia, and every last ruling may claim to be rooted in the Fiqh and ultimately the Quran and the Sunnah, but if it's the state that's so active in legislation and choosing which fatwas it wants to follow. Is this really an Islamic system or is this the, the uh, essence, the framework is a Western system, the nation state, the Ministry of Justice, the legal statutes and the insignificant charge with an Islamic veneer and a good deal of Islamic content. That's a question I think that the Ummah hasn't really faced up to. Now the Ulama who look into this, or who have considered it, and you can find some people in out of the way places where there's still a memory of how the thing used to work, the local wisdom model, some parts of Mauritania, Yemen, perhaps out of the way places, corners of Sumatra. Um, the idea of the impersonal, statute-based administration of revealed law, ultimately on behalf of the state, and the state itself may be corrupt, that's another problem. Um, would tend to emphasize that uh, communities should seek their own structures of mediation and not overly rely on centralized law. So that would be uh, essentially akin to our idea of civil society, professional associations that regulate their own affairs, um, guilds, and guilds with a significant of classical Islam, not regulated again by the state. Neighborhood associations, um, local charities, uh, locally based initiatives, not part of enormous mega global charities, um, but based on local communities with local awareness and local wisdom. So that would be one partial solution using the requirement or the preference to use zakat and other sadaqa funding locally rather than sending it to some kind of local flyaway place. That would be one possibility. Um, but generally the, the question is a real one. Uh, is the sharia in its full classical sense actually possible in the context of the world of nation states? Um, or is it just a matter of doing what we can? The final issue that these traditionalists will say is that in that context where you have the law turned into a very blunt instrument, because a single, a one-size-fits-all model of law, even if it's in the Sharia, is going to impose injustices because the Qadi can't make allowances for the situation that he sees in front of him. Uh, but if you have that system, then it has to be uh, as fluid and as gentle as possible. It has to be based on the ruhas. And this is always the interpretation of the Ottoman ulama, and is one of the principles that fed into the, the Majella, where possible take the easier option, because then you're less likely to impose hardship on people. <coughs> if people want to find a hard option, they're welcome to impose it upon themselves. But generally the principle of, of fatwa and of qada in this age should be recognizing people's weakness and not uh, exacerbating the inequalities inherent in a national law uh, by making the law actually tough.
Okay, that's basically what I wanted to say. Uh, anybody want to ask any questions on this specifically? Yeah. I guess the question is, what can we do, like individuals? How can we follow the well, uh, the Sharia in this sea of confusion? Yeah, it's. I think at least it's important to recognise that those places that claim to be imposing Sharia are doing something that ultimately is Western, to do with the Western model of the corporate state that monopolizes as much as the public square as possible. To be sceptical about their claims to be instantiating Sharia, because it's not clear that they have the right, to, it's not clear that any ruler has the right to decide on issues of fatwa. Um, which is essentially what a modern state would be doing. So, first of all, a scepticism about that whole project. And then uh, uh, an intention of rebuilding it from the ground up, because there are things that you can do with um, local associations, I mean, even the University of Cambridge, ruled by statutes and ordinances, which are not imposed by Parliament, but which is the local community, academic community, deciding that it wants to be regulated by certain people. So, as I say, you can have small areas, small groups, where they've decided that certain things that are not to do with criminal law um, can be determined on Sharia grounds. Some of the Sharia tribunals in this country operate on that basis. So it's just a question of slowly reconstructing things from bottom up. But the big philosophical question still remains, which is, could you in theory have a 21st century state without a Ministry of Justice? Could it actually work? Just local bodies, maybe not even with salaries, part-time magistrates uh, dishing out the law and fining people. Oh, he's rich, so I'll charge him five hundred pounds for not paying the congestion charge. He's only got a scooter, so I'll just charge him twenty pounds, which is what the Qadi would be able to do, which you can't do in modern law, apart from certain flexibilities within tariffs that the law uh, specifies. Could you actually go back to that system? Um, is it an issue that the Ulama has even raised? It might be an alternative to the modern craze for over-regulating and legislating everything, especially the European Union rules for the, the curvature of bananas and the kind of things that they're imposing on everybody, which is driving everybody mad. Uh, maybe it's an alternative to that. Yeah. Um. Is there an Islamic model for like the appointment of sultans, muftis, etc.? Or again, is that left to the individual communities to decide? Uh, it depends on, in the case of the mufti, uh, generally a, a mufti would be given an ijaza by his own teacher to give fatwa. In a complicated kind of way, that doesn't necessarily mean that he'd consider himself competent to do it. Uh, and sometimes you get cases of scholars authorizing people to be mufti, but not letting them be mufti, as it were. Theoretically, you're competent to do it, but I don't think that, as a person, you're ready for such a responsibility. And there are plenty of cases of that. Um, in terms of the appointment of the sultan, that's a different matter. The appointment of the sultan, generally the wisdom of the Ahl al-Sunnah from the earliest period was that they avoided two extremes the Kharijite position, which was basically whoever is praying the most should be the head of state. Um, and the Shi'i position, which says whoever is most closely descended through the male line from the Ahlid Bayt should be the head of state, a kind of monarchical primogeniture system. Uh, and the Ahlid Sunnah has so often occupied not just one point, but a, a large area in the middle, where generally they would recognize the legitimacy of whoever happened to be the ruler of the Muslims, um, whatever the procedure might have been, whether through acclamation or some kind of electoral process, or whether it be through primogeniture, the caliph had a son that he wanted the son to be in charge and cut the head off anybody who took a different view, and the ulama would recognize the validity of that. Generally, Sunni Islam is quietistic regarding politics. In the Arab Spring, for instance, we haven't seen too much enthusiasm in the tradition of all of that for all of this stuff in the streets. Um, because the Sunni position is that you stay with the ruler because that's 
less bad than a catastrophe of civil war. And we still don't know what will be the outcome of Egypt and Libya and those places. It looks unstable. So that wisdom might well be justified. But in terms of the original sources, the Qur'an and the Sunnah, there is no political process specified there. There's nothing there. Any of those texts that says the ruler has to be appointed according to a particular method. There's all kinds of stuff about how the ruler has to be just and efficient and honest and righteous. But the actual appointment is something that has been deliberately left open because different cultures are going to need to do it in different ways. Yep. <coughs> So my question is, uh, well, even from what I've gathered, uh, Islamic law was classically implemented on the local level with the local culture and the local community. I presume there were some inadequacies in there anyway. I mean, I'm presuming Congress could be blind, etc. But there yep. were definitely inadequacies. Um, my question really is, uh, can the Islamic law be uh, implemented on a national level um, fairly accurately? I mean, with any system, there seems to be inadequacies. Well, it depends on your interpretation. Do you mean the classical model, which is highly decentralized, or the modern Islamist model of a ministry of justice and the implementation of Sharia through a, a unified statute? Well, no, um, the classical model, that was decentralized. Um, that, uh, yeah, well, I'm not sure. The classical model was based on an extremely stable and static society. So the Mughaldi was somebody who was probably in his village for 50 years, and maybe his dad had done it before him, and it was the same old people, the same old families, he knew every inch of the local neighborhood, and he could immediately see what the issue was and resolve a case, even quite a complicated case, in, in half an hour. Nowadays, everybody's traveling around and moving, and um, everything is complicated. Even one neighborhood can change beyond recognition in 10, 20 years. So the idea of a local wisdom is a bit more problematic. You might say we actually need it more um, because we're also alienated and we don't really have roots in a particular place and there's no such thing as community any longer. But Qadi could be a figure of, of unity, but in practice it's, it's, um, it's, it's getting harder to see how that would work. Um, for instance, the village where I live, I've been there about 10 years, Judging by the number of for sale signs, I would say I've probably been in the village longer than most people who are there now. So the Qadi of the village, it wouldn't be a question of him knowing the local families and knowing the history of disputes over fields, over fields and ditches and irrigation and windmills. It's all strange if everybody's commuting to London or wherever. So the model of a local Qadar, a local Mufti, I don't know. Uh, but of course, in many traditional parts of the Muslim world, things are quite static, and there's a lot of wisdom in having uh, a Qadi who knows the local people and is trusted by the local people, rather than some official with a briefcase who turns up from Islamabad or Algiers or wherever and tells people right from wrong. So Muslims in those countries that have had the Arab Spring, if they find themselves in a position where they think they can influence matters, what should they seek to do, or what? Not pushing towards a centralised Islamic system, what alternatives do they have? Well, it's a question of being practical and recognising that the existing structures have to be maintained for the time being, because there has to be a structure, there have to be laws. Um, but in the longer term, to try and move things away from the highly centralized model that many third world countries have adopted um, the last few decades and decentralize and to try and farm things out to local charities, local communities, to re um, endow the Alcoff, for instance, so that the universities and the hospitals are independent foundations with their own Alcoff rather than just controlled by bureaucratic ministries. They're already starting to do that in Libya. They're trying to free up some of the alcohol in some places. Very difficult. In Egypt, for instance, Al Azhar would love to be independent and would be hugely wealthy if they could get their alcohol back. But the reality is that they were confiscated 50, 60 years ago. People are now living on those lands and they bought them and sold them. And how do you how do you take them back?
somebody's got a house on a farm that used to belong to Al-Azhar, how do you reclaim it? You can pay for it, but they don't have the money to do that on such a huge scale. It's not like the uh, German Bundesrepublik, which can look at the estates that were taken over by the communists in the eastern zone and just pay for them to be given back to their former owners. And some well, there isn't that kind of money to do that. Um, but the al used to be uh, enormous. About a third of Istanbul was al until the 1920s. Um, the Waqf of Ubaidullah Ahrar, one of the great scholar saints of uh, Samarkand, was used to support all of the madrasas to the north of Samarkand, which went on to convert what's now Kazakhstan. <coughs> the communists took it over. And now they've got nothing. How, how do they get it back? I don't know. But that would be very important because in order to have that local model to support the local quality, to support the local structures, they have to be a, a local source of revenue. Yeah. yeah. What about the early part of the talk about uh, the, the Shadi uh, principle that uh, you're not obligated to do right or wrong unless mm -hmm. so, so where is the period what is the period of revelation so so was the time of the process and before that was it not a period of revelation for those who are following the previous yeah period? it's a it's a good question um, only Allah knows whether somebody has been reached by revelation mm -hmm. to the extent that it does become binding upon him mm -hmm. so for instance they discuss the case of somebody who is in India and is a Hindu villager and he hears that there's people called Muslims and they eat cows and they conquer a lot so it doesn't sound very interesting. Is he required to become Muslim? Is it his sin that he doesn't accept it? Uh, and somebody like Shah Wali Allah Dehlavi would say no, it's the responsibility of the Muslims to convey. It's not his responsibility to find out. There's no basis for him to have a valid curiosity. Um, so basically it's the sound conveyance of the valid revelation of the age um, so that triggers uh, moral responsibility in Sharia. So is that then the impetus for revelation uh, for for Dharma, that it's yeah. because it's obligatory on yeah. people? Yeah. Uh, this again is from the early part of the talk. You mentioned that matter is just matter; it doesn't recognize or it doesn't have mm -hmm. any intrinsic good or bad. Um, just would appreciate if you, if you could clarify because in the Quran there's uh, so many things are said about the matter, mm -hmm. about mountains, about stones yep. that, that they recognize Allah and then mm -hmm. they follow the commands yep. of Allah. Mm -hmm. So how, how is it? Sure, uh, in terms of their conformity to natural laws, mm -hmm. which is part of matter, of mm -hmm. course, but those natural laws are not intrinsic to the existence of matter in a certain way. The laws could have been different. They're operating the way they do, and there's certain constants and the force of gravity are there because Allah has vested those things in matter. The energy that exists between the elements of a nucleus and an atom is determined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's something intrinsic to dead matter that can determine that. It could have been otherwise. And the string theorists would say there's these physical constants of what they would say arbitrary uh, interruptions into the fabric of space and time. We would say it's the divine determination. So, yet there is meaning, there is law, there is beauty which is intrinsic, but it's only there because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, uh, uh, as it were, irradiated creation with those things. Mm -hmm. It's not something that's, that's intrinsic to the nature of stuff. So isn't, isn't, that, isn't that true for the human beings as well? It is only Allah who put that one. It's not intrinsic to human beings. But what's intrinsic to us is just the body that drops away and doesn't yeah. last very long. And what is that? Why should that have intrinsic rights and ability or anything? But mm -hmm. it's this, the spirit that's been breathed into us, which is the thing that is uh, extraneous and that makes us you know, the, the best of creatures if, if we shape up. If we keep the spirit as a dominant principle mm -hmm. in the body, then then we can be khulafat. So the the socio-political legal system as it, it has manifested in classical Islamic tradition, mm 
can it not be different in future in the sense that as long as there are certain certain uh, as long as the final results are not bad can it is there anything to prevent from it being different from how it has been in the past given that the human existence has mm -hmm. to yep. radically change by modernity well it, it it always has been changing and that's what HD had is about and no doubt it will change at an accelerated rate uh, the, the question that I was raising was not quite that it was not about whether the content of the Sharia can and should be open to updating emendation um, within the boundaries of what's intrinsic and possible the question is whether if you have a concept of the state which is a purely western origin which is the state legislating controlling the laws which are imposed on all of the courts and you have Islamic laws within that framework is it still an Islamic system? That's the question I'm asking. Yeah. And based on this idea of a decentralized uh, legal system mm -hmm. so that would suggest that the idea of a nation state, a group of Muslims uh, in the context of let's say partition formation of Pakistan, mm -hmm. that wouldn't have been uh, necessary or, I mean, like, in that connection. Yeah, the, most of the fully traditional ulama in India didn't go along with Jinnah's idea. He was a classic example of a secularized Ismaili nationalist who was worried about the Hindu nationalists. It wasn't a Sharia decision. Um, certainly the ulama of, of Deoband and most of the ulama subcontinent. The last thing they wanted was the Muslims of India to be divided. Um, and it's imposed all kinds of strains. Pakistan itself is not a state that historically or geopolitically has much depth. The, the great Muslim civilizational axis in India was never north-south, it was always east-west. Kabul, Peshawar, Lahore, Amritsar, Delhi, and then points east. That was the axis of Islam. With partition, that was cut off. And instead you have this new strange thing along the Indus Valley that says that the Sindhis can have something in common with the Punjabis and the, the Kashmiris. It, it's historically very difficult, ambitious, because they don't have a deep sense of being part of a single entity. And of course, the story of Pakistani politics has been sort of Benazir with that Sindhi thing, and then Nawaz Sharif and the Punjabis, and it's a kind of tribal tug of war. It's not really about principle, it's about regions that historically don't know how to get along. So I think uh, generally the wisdom of the ulama in opposing the partition, quite apart from the horror of the event and the bloodshed and the abandoned mosques and the, the misery of it all, um, but it's, it's turned into a bad decision. It hasn't, it hasn't served the Muslims. Apart from anything else also, it has weakened the Muslims in India itself. If they're 10-15% of the population, they can be pushed around. If they were still 30% of the population, that would be a lot harder. And great Muslim cities like Hyderabad are now kind of sad shells of their former, former selves. Madras is gone and Hindu statues everywhere and the palace is deserted. It's a, a catastrophe that's happened. And as for moving the Hindus out of East and West Pakistan, it's not obvious why that was beneficial for the Muslims in that time. Were people in danger of becoming Hindu? I don't think so, particularly. Why couldn't they have stayed in their homes? Yeah. Well, it would be good if there were local muftis. Uh, some places have them. Uh, Australia has a mufti. So they have a new one appointed in November. Uh, but there's still a long way to go. The new mufti of Australia doesn't speak English, for instance. 
but in the longer term, that's what we should aspire to. But we've kind of forgotten that institution of fatwa, ifta, muftis, ijtihad, uh, and the internet hasn't helped because we can always look something up, and if we don't like the fatwa, we can enter it again in Google, and somebody will give us the answer that we do want. Yeah. Often that's how we do business with a lot of religion these days, unfortunately. Um, but there's no substitute from for being with a teacher who's constantly around, who knows you, who knows your circumstances, who can figure out when you're trying to play games and when you're being serious. It's the internet kind. It's actually a responsibility in a good Muslim community to train people up to do that. It becomes a far behind which community has to have somebody who can give uh, guidance in religion. talked in the beginning about the difference between universal law and Sharia law. Yeah. Um, how can we know what universal law is, especially living in a time where, with logic, you can say everything is acceptable, yeah. or in liberal democracy where everything feels acceptable now as well? Well, in the 18th century, Immanuel Kant thought that it determined that there were certain universals, certain principles of altruism, that one should operate according to a categorical imperative which he thought meant that you should act on the basis of any principle which is capable of being made a universal rule. There were ways in which they tried to rationalize it, but the extent to which they can really find intrinsic properties of good and evil in the gorgeous universe is not really very clear, and philosophers like Schopenhauer and Nietzsche were very skeptical about Kant's project and assumed that it was just a kind of Christian ghost, as John Gray puts it, that people are still desperate to find virtue and reasons for legislating and for the often very ambitious modern projects of universal declarations of human rights and so forth. But philosophically, it's very difficult to create universals if all you have is matter, to show that certain things are intrinsically anything. That's very arguable. Anybody know who wrote the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? written by somebody called Charles Malik, who's an extremely right-wing Lebanese lawyer, who founded the Falangist militia that carried out the Sabra and Shatina massacres. And he was the lawyer who was appointed by the UN, I guess in the late 1940s, to write the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, on the basis of what he, as a triumphalist Catholic, pro-European Lebanese, took to be universals, which of course were all the European universals. In the West, universal rights mean what educated Westerners like. That's the definition of the universal. And if you're in an Afghan village and you don't think these things are universal, then it's just too bad. It's an irony. Okay, handle with that. Thank you for your patience.